Hello, Kira Koto. Mark the demystifier here. Down on the beach today. Oh, it's a glorious day, still quite chilly, but uh, rather beautiful and great sunshine. So the sand that I showed you just there, the black, almost black sand that's glistening, is, um, is a local um, feature. And uh, it's rather beautiful, it's full of iron, apparently. Um, and the reason that I started with an image of sand on the beach is that this video is going to be about abundance and scarcity consciousness and how that has an impact upon retroactive jealousy. Before we get into that, if you want to support the channel and you're watching on YouTube, please hit the like button and please subscribe and please head over to Patreon and sign up as a patron and you get access to exclusive content and other benefits. I'm having to talk quite loudly over the crash of the waves, so I hope you can hear this okay. What then is scarcity consciousness and abundance consciousness and what's that got to do with retroactive jealousy? Well, how do you see the world? Do you see the world as a place full of plenty? Do you see yourself, the world as a, a place where things come to you fairly easily? Or do you see the world as a place of scarcity and paucity, where everything is hard to come by and you can never get enough of what you need? So these are important things to think about because they have a big effect on your life is as within so without the way we think about things has an impact on what happens in our life and I for one believe that if you hold a belief of scarcity then you're more likely to be poor and if you hold a belief of abundance you're more likely to be rich I guess there's probably no scientific evidence to prove that but there, there are lots of um, lots of things that feature that there are lots of it's a, a very commonly talked about um, aspect of life. And I have friends for whom that's just a normal part of language. They'll talk about abundance consciousness and, and will try and live their lives in a way that develops that and moves away from scarcity consciousness. And I have myself, I'm, I, I think I grew up probably in, in quite a sense of scarcity uh, with hoarding tendencies. Uh, I used to love going rummaging in skips and, and that's kind of cool because uh, I like to do kind of craft projects and things like that. And um, you find great, great raw materials in skips and, and in areas where there's waste, where waste has been done. But a bigger part of that was just me not being able to bear the idea of seeing anything usable being wasted. And that came from a place of scarcity consciousness. And I'm consciously working on that, and I think to, to my benefit. I think this probably has its origins in childhood and um, particularly things like sibling rivalry and it always interests me when subjects like immigration come up and people get really really uptight really angry about the idea of people coming into the country um, as if you know there's not enough money to go around there's not enough health care to go around and that you know if we allow in you know, a few hundred extra immigrants, then you know, that means that there'll be less on my table. People don't actually consciously believe that, but that's kind of the implication. So think about whether you generally see things from the perspective of abundance, or whether you generally see things from the perspective of scarcity. But think particularly about sex and love and how you see them. Do you see love as something that's very rare, as something that is really, you know, not coming your way, <laughs> hardly ever, hardly, you know, very difficult, you know, to come by, like, you know, the proverbial rocking horse ship. Do you see sex the same way? Do you see sex as something that, you know, uh, you know, you really, you really want, you really need, but, you know, you don't get any, it's not coming your way. Everybody else gets sex, but you don't. Because this will have a huge impact on, retroactive jealousy. 
So if you think about when things are scarce, like during the Second World War in the United Kingdom and uh, the food was scarce and it was rationed. So you know, when things are scarce, you are very, very cautious about how you use them. You, know, you, you don't kind of regard them in a way that's willy-nilly. You save them for a rainy day, you save them for a special occasion. But actually sex and love, if you think about it, they're, they're infinite. I mean, particularly love. Love is, quite, I guess, more abstract. Sex, I suppose, is, is governed by time and energy. <laughs> and, uh, but still, you know, not really a limited commodity. It's a very, very abundant commodity. But if you think sex and love is something that is scarce, hard won, highly precious, rare, then the idea that somebody gives away sex, <laughs> if, and that's the way you would probably look at it if you're looking from a point of view of scarcity, somebody gives their sex to somebody who, you know, maybe isn't perfect, maybe isn't ideal, may not be the best circumstances, it might not be the best time, it might not be the best place. That's where scarcity and abundance consciousness come into it. So what I would urge you to do is just have a think about that. Does that fit with your retroactive jealousy? Is that part of the pattern? And is that something that's just limited to sex and love? Or is that something that's also connected to money, health, friendship, success? So I'll leave that one with you. And uh, wishing you a glory of abundance. Rangi Marge. Goodbye.